Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, event of the Enrichment Program in the Fall, which theme uh, uh, is uh, composed around the topic of large marine animals and understanding how marine animals move in the ocean, how we move in the ocean and on land, and deriving knowledge and insights from this, and also realizing the importance that roles that these animals play in the ocean and therefore have additional motivations to engage in conservation. So uh, I would like to start by thanking everyone in the enrichment uh, program, program uh, for their efforts and hard work and energy to uh, be able to compose this exciting program. And I've been uh, trying to supply some of the scientific content because in parallel, uh, Professor Xian Liang Sang and myself are co-chairing a workshop that is brought to cause uh, top experts in the world on the field of marine megaphone and also human uh, mobility. So uh, tonight we have one of them as a speaker, uh, is Professor Rory Wilson, uh, Professor of Zoology in uh, Swansea University in the UK, and arguably one of the world's top experts on large marine animals and the way they move and how they migrate across the globe, and particularly uh, for his work on birds and penguins in particular. So, uh, Professor Wilson uh, graduated from Oxford with a degree in zoology and moved on to do a PhD in Cape Town in South Africa. And then he returned to Europe where he took uh, a series of positions, first in Sweden, then uh, in France with CNRS, where I think he still holds a position in CNRS in France and then Germany, to then return to, the, to South Africa and finally uh, take the professorship at Swansea University on zoology. So I mentioned that he is one of the world's top experts on, uh, on understanding the movement of uh, marine organisms and uh, particularly birds, but also he has worked across a range of species, all the way from cockroaches to birds to cheetah uh, 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 cats and also uh, humans. And tonight we're going to have a sample of the diversity of his work and the amazing new discoveries that he's making about the way we move and how much uh, insight can we derive from the small, subtle details of movement of animals, including humans. And he's also a superb communicator, and he was the chief uh, science uh, advisor to National Geographic for their series of uh, documentaries on migrations in the large migrations in the animal world. And also, he's developed a new technology to be able to track animals, and he developed a device called the Animal Diary that uh, is attached to all kinds of animals and delivers information on their position, but also on their condition, their physiology, and is open up for a wealth of information and understanding on the behavior and condition of animals all across the world. So he is now uh, engaged and leading a team uh, looking at the movement of animals and humans uh, at Swansea University that is interdisciplinary. So he is working together with computer scientists, uh, uh, helping him to uh, visualize data, complex data sets, also with uh, medicals and psychologists and different disciplines to better understand the meaning of movement. As he's, he's going to share some of those insights uh, with us tonight. Uh, he has uh, developed a very complex presentation with many animations and he tells me that if the animation fails because of technology, he's prepared to do the, moons, the, the moon uh, walk dance here or maybe play piano. So that we have there a backup uh, series of instruments just in case all fails. But we, ho we hope for the best and please join me in thanking uh, Professor Rory Wilson. Welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, what a pleasure to be here. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, I have to tell you, if I'm looking hot and sweaty, it's because I'm hot and sweaty. All right. I, I had to run back to get a shirt um, from here. So, um, The magic of animal movement. Let's, let's start. Why movement? Well, you have to remember that molecules move and waves move. Everything moves in our universe. Plate tectonics move. Thinking over scales, the planets move, moons move, the whole universe is expanding. Everything moves. Um, so it's not the movement's not important in a general sense. I love this, they're following me with the lights wherever I go. Um, uh, the physicists have more or less got it sorted out. Uh, they can explain a lot of the movement we see from non-living things. Everyone recognize him? Okay, there he is again, a couple of years later, um, after studying physics. 
Um, so I'm going to, in the context of the universe, I'm going to introduce you to something that's really trivial, and that is movement in living systems. Because as far as we know, there's only living systems on this planet, and it's only on the top out a bit. But I think it's important. And the other thing is, you're going to say to me, well, what about plants? They don't move. You're right. We'll kick them out. Um, so, what about animal movement? I'm going to talk about lots of different types of movement. There's movement inside us. Our hearts are beating. Uh, Swansea University students don't have a heart that beats, but otherwise, in most people. Um, the outside movement, so I'm moving and I'm not actually going anywhere. And of course, um, there's translocational movement. There's actually going somewhere. So, think about all the different types of movement that go on in normal living systems. And my mission today is to give you my small spin, my ideas, some of my stuff on into the fascinating world of animal movement. So let's do it. So I'm going to start with some examples of translocational movement. Um, that's, the, you know, that's the bit where you actually move. Jump to that. And the first question is, why bother moving? Quite honestly, if you're in a place where you're comfortable, you've got no predators, no parasites, you've got plenty of food, you're in heaven. Okay? But the reality of Earth is it's often quite different. Welcome to Earth. If you're in that wrong place, you have to move to get to a better place. Okay? And my uh, initiation into the world of moving came with penguins because I was obsessed with penguins. I have been since I was four years old. And they are great movers. I don't mean on land. I mean the ones underwater. And so I found this out when I was... That's me, just before I give, started this lecture. Um, <laughs> that it actually is me. Um, I remember watching penguins at a zoo and being hugely impressed by the way they swam. Uh, and this obsession with penguins led me to go and do a PhD on African penguins, uh, which are a conservation issue. They were a conservation then, issue then, and they're much more of it now. Uh, the population was crashing. It continues to crash. Some people say they're in the twilight of their existence. So there was a real conservation slant and a real reason to study them. And the belief was it was something to do with... Um, what they do at sea, the way they move, the way they pick up or don't pick up food. But the problem is penguins hunt under, under water. And so this is the sort of environment that you can barely see that. I'll go over here, then they'll turn the light off. Um, this is the sort of environment uh, I have to work in if I want to study African penguins. So I thought, well, that's all right. I'll go out on boats. So this is the first one, the joy of watching penguins at sea, part one. And I do get seasick. Um, the truth of the matter is, whilst you're being seasick, you don't see any penguins. See, because penguins, there's a clip in the middle of that screen. Penguins do not like boats, so they will dive. So don't give up watching penguins from a boat. And so I did all the scuba stuff and tried to watch penguins underwater, and that doesn't work either. So what do you do? And this problem is a problem faced by many marine animals, things that swim under the water. We don't see them. Uh, or we certainly don't see them easily, and we don't see them for long. Um, so where do we go? Um, this is my approach. Develop some tags. Put some tags on the animal, and if you can't be with the animal, the tag will record what the animal's doing, and then when the animal comes back, or you get the tag back, then you can find out what's gone on. So, when I started this, sort of in the Jurassic, um, there, I couldn't buy tags off the shelf, so I had to think, how am I going to do this? I had no money, I had no resources, and I had no tags. So I thought I would develop a system made out of a syringe. Here's the syringe here, which I cut the both ends off. And I put a bung, which I made from a float on the beach. And I wound some piano wire into a spring. And uh, the idea was that um, under normal operation, if I put that on a penguin, this was the theory, facing forwards, the water pressure would push that bung back depending on the speed. Okay? So if I could calibrate it, I could read and swim alongside the penguin. I could say, yes, it's swimming at 20 miles an hour. Um, but then I needed to record that. And so in those days, I plonked a film over the whole apparatus, and I put some radioactive phosphorus on the bung so that the radioactive phosphorus would... Um, I'm losing this microphone now. I know what it's like for Michael Jackson. Um, um, so that the radioactive phosphorus on the bung would um, expose the film. And here it is. This is um, the first time I tried it out. That's a Coca-Cola. Uh, the breastplate is made out of the bottom of a Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, the harness is a bit of leather. And there's a penguin. There's a person. That's me, actually. Um, there it is from the side. 
And so here's the situation. Look how badly wound the spring is as well. There goes the, the, um, the film, and this is how they normally swim. And so actually, after the bird had been at sea wearing this apparatus, you generally got two spots. And one's the, distance, uh, one's the spot at zero, and the other's the spot at the normal traveling speed. And the distance between them gave me the speed, and the density told me the time, and so I could work out how far that penguin had been. So here's my study site in Marcus Island. The star is where the penguins are, and I could figure out that they went that far, maximum. So that was, like I say, hundreds of years ago. Um, and it's quite surprising uh, how little was known. Nowadays, you really can't do anything unless you've got a team. And things have changed hugely. And actually, to be fair, what I'm talking about this evening is not just my work, but the work of all the people with whom I've worked who are brilliant. There are some of them. Um, but you really do need electronics engineers, and you really do need computer scientists, and you really do need mathematicians. So this sort of stuff is created by using a team. So this is the first time I got onto an electronic solid state, what's called solid state logger. And there it is, a pretty clunky thing, and each of those arrows point to a sensor. You put lots of sensors, you can sense temperature and light and speed and direction and this sort of thing. Um, and that was the first time I ever put it on a penguin um, in Antarctica. So there's a Gen 2 penguin, 1990, you see black, flash, streamlined, every penguin should have one. Um, today, it's gone crazy. That is a much more powerful tag than I used then. Um, that's what we call the daily diary. Uh, it records 400 pieces of data every single second. Okay, um, Acceleration, magnetometry, all these clever things. So we're hugely advanced in that respect. The problem is, this electronics is really cool, but it's also really fragile. So you can't just go sticking it with some glue on, on an animal. You've got to put it in a housing. So the tricky subject is how you make a housing that's appropriate. And uh, we started making our housings by printing, you know, 3D printing them. And the nice thing about 3D printing is people think 3, 3D printing is completely useless. You can do wonderful things with 3D printers. That's a 3D printed gun. And that's a 3D printed bike. And of course, other more useful stuff like the shoes and the clothes. But the point about it is it's actually incredibly powerful technology if you combine it with um, appropriate um, things to make the tags as nice as they can be for the animals that wear them. So take, take the example of the imperial cormorant. See, nice and streamlined. If you want to make a tag for an imperial cormorant and you want to make it really cool, then you get a model of your imperial cormorant, you put it through some computer-aided design, you, you can actually simulate the drag and simulate the best place for the tag to be in the best form that the tag should have, and you can produce a tag in the computer before you actually make the housing for the outside. So that's an animal-friendly package. You want to be friendly to the animal. Otherwise, there's no point. The other thing is, you know, this is a Galapagos sea lion, and it looks very friendly, but I can tell you something about sea lions, and Dan will tell you this as well. They've got really big teeth. And um, it was uh, sedated, by the way. Don't just think it was sleeping. Um, and one of the things they like to do is they have a complete disregard for cost and effort when it comes to devices. So they do like to remove them, bite them. Um, and so things like um, computer simulations of bite, pressures, and so on, allow us to build tags or to construct tags first in the computer before we construct them else there. This is, a, this is a constructed entirely inside the computer and has a tag in it and a releaser and a VHF tr transmitter and a whole pile of other things. And so with our tags, we can go and plonk them on all sorts of uh, wonderful enigmatic um, marine animals. That's a white screen, um, uh, elephant seals, whales, and the like. And we can find out all sorts of exciting things about them. Uh, and of course, depending on the animal, we put them on in different ways. Birds, particular, particularly favorite of birds. So where can this take us, this electronic revolution of really cool tags? Well, one thing, and the thing all marine people like to go with, is depth. Obviously, uh, let's look at depth. So in one dimension, if you look at one dimension movement, the depth scenario, Here's an example of a depth trace from a penguin. So this is what the penguin did, okay? Went down, this is an emperor penguin, went down and went back to the surface. And it, the, the maximum depth of that dive was about 416 meters, right? So if you only record depth, you think, your question is, 416 meters, how on earth can a bird, they're birds, withstand that pressure? 
If, on the other hand, you start to add other sensors, like light sensors, you realize it might give you a different question. Like, oh, it's hunting in the dark. How on earth can they hunt in the dark? So the point about it is, is choosing your sensors for your tag will make a huge difference with what you can do and the way you think about your animal. OK, the other thing is you can measure temperature and, and salinity and all these other things, and you can put those in context as well. So one of the most useful things um, you can do, I reckon, if you've got a depth sensor, is just measure, measure depth and then put a speed sensor on. And then put a compass on. And the thing about a compass and speed and depth is you can dead reckon. And this is what dead reckoning is. Here's our whale. I did this on the train up to London before I came here, I've got to say. And this whale is heading at this... It has this heading. OK? And it has this heading at this speed for this long and then decides to change and then goes at another heading for so long. And the point about it is, is if you know that information, you can reconstruct the path of the whale using vectorial, um, using vectors. And so this is what we do. So here, now, is a system put on penguins, which doesn't record depth every 10 seconds or every 15 seconds. It records it 40 times a second. And this is the trajectory of an Adili penguin, starting with the arrow and swimming round and then doing some crazy stuff on the right-hand side and then swimming back. And the nice thing about that is that tells you even what the animal's doing when it's far underwater where you wouldn't get any radio transmission. Uh, and so, if I apply that to my old scenario, African penguins, and I put one of those on African penguins, instead of just saying, Here's the, they, this is as far as they go, this is what it tells me. And between when I started and today, that is a massive, massive leap. And uh, one of the cool things about animal movement is, if you, if you, if you produce these tracks, it's like writing. It's sort of like, this is an albatross. It looks like an elf has written it. It's beautiful. Um, and there's a sort of, it's like 3D handwriting in the sky or in the water um, as a plains. So, for example, you can take um, a seal and you can look at the, um, this is a six-day foraging trip by a, by a harbour seal and you can see every dive and you can see, well, actually, it's tracking the bottom and there's a huge amount of detail which you can get by using this dead reckoning. So you can find out where animals go. And you can do it on a dive-by-dive dive or on a second-by-second second basis. This is your elephant seal. This is a single dive by an elephant seal. Went down on the left-hand side, did some crazy stuff in, in, in the middle, and then went up at the end. And just to give you an idea of what that means in terms of real perspective, have a look at this. This is a, this is a simulation. I'm sorry it's not beating its flippers, but we'll come to that later, of an elephant seal dive um, using a model... Sorry, down of, a, you know, of an eared seal. But anyway... Um, I'd like you to look at the scale over which this animal is operating. So, as it moves away from the surface, and as the animation pans back, uh, you realise that what you see as an animal at the surface of the water from a ship is the tiniest fragment of their real life. And the writing of the seal goes on hundreds of metres underwater. You see, you can still see it, it's like a fly. I won't run it to the end, but we will run it till we get round the corner where you see all these sort of like the convolutions, the knots coming into it, doing whatever it was doing, and then uh, look how small it is. And there, look what's coming up. We're not going there, but it gives you an idea of what incredible stuff goes on um, in some of these animals underwater. They're air breathers. We still actually don't know how they catch their prey because a lot of it happens in the, what we'd consider to be dark. Um, we can, of course, cut out sections, expand them up, and um, we can put, using our various tags, we can put body positions in there, and we can speculate where they might be catching prey. Um, fabulous movement, fabulous, but it's like a dance. But, of course, you get to that, and you know this elephant seal's been going down there to catch prey, and then you think, well, when? When is it catching prey? Um, this is an interesting case, Wandering Albatross, um, work that I did with uh, Henri Weimerskirch um, and, and Peter Ryan, actually. Um, and these are amazing birds. They're very big. There's an example of a chick. Never mess with the chicks. There's a slight perspective thing there, but it looks cool. Anyway, I didn't Photoshop this. Um, and what they do is 
they've got these chicks that hang around and then the, the adults take off and they fly around the oceans for six days or so, it depends on their stage of life, uh, and they go looking for, for squid. And this is a typical track of a, of a wandering albatross from, from its island. You can see, give you an idea of scale, um, there's nest 42 uh, on Marion Island, and there is the bottom of South Africa. So they move huge distances. And if you want to know when albatrosses eat, well, one of the things we thought of doing is, well, how do we find out when an albatross eats? Um, you know the ice cream thing? Well, albatrosses eat cold things all the time. So if we put a pill inside an albatross that measured temperature, then there it is. I've gone into a cross-section of the albatross. So just like ice cream, when it eats a squid, the temperature should drop. Now, if we know where it is, there goes the squid in the albatross, plop, and the temperature should go down. So we can look at the temperature inside the stomach of the albatross when it comes back and find out when it's been eating. And so true to form, if you look at the stomach temperature over time in hours from this albatross, it was flying during most of the day, and there are all these temperature drops which are every time it either took a sip of water or it ate something. So that's fine. We know they catch squid. Squid's very widely distributed. They've got to go many miles before they find a squid, fly around, see one, land, um, and eat it, and then fly again. So that makes sense. So we can put, if we look at, if we cut a bit out of the albatross track, and we look at where they've been eating squid, we can say, yes, they've had squid here and here. And that's great. This is the bit at night. See that, where it's sort of gone into a strange sort of movement? And um, the technology at the time had said, well, albatrosses are on the surface of the water at night. They're not moving, um, so they must be asleep. And so, obviously, if we look in the periods of night, when they're supposed to be asleep, um, we find that they're still eating sometimes. So what, how does that work? Like someone's bringing squid to the albatross. Um, and in fact, putting our technology on, we've discovered this. The albatrosses, a lot of the night, do not sleep. And in certain places, not everywhere, in certain places, what they do is they spin round and round. If you look at this track here, this is where the albatross has been spinning round and round at night. I'll blow it up. And there are bits where, these are the bits where the stomach temperature sensors tell us they've been eating squid. Just because they've gone round and round in a strange way. And so what is actually happening, this is what we think is happening, is there are places in the, in the ocean where uh, if you agitate the water, you get bioluminescence. And um, agitating the water uh, makes light. It doesn't work all over the ocean. And the light attracts the squid. Squid's deep under, deep under the surf, deep, deep under water and says, oh, it's beautiful, and swims foolishly towards the light, and the albatross eats it. So uh, what we think is happening is they're using natural light to catch their squid at night. Um, and then, of course, they catch the squid, and they go back, and they give it to their chick, and we're none the wiser. OK, that's OK. But I think we can, one of the problems with the stomach temperature sensors is if, if a, a warm-blooded animal like an albatross eats lots of things in quick succession, the stomach temperature is quite slow to react. So can we refine animals eating still further? Can we actually um, see a bit better, a bit more precisely when they eat? And this is my old friend, the Magellanic penguin, lives in Argentina and Chile uh, and the Falklands. And uh, we're going to talk about beak movement, never mind spinning movement or translocational movement, actual just beak movement. And here's how this works. Firstly, take a note at the end of the beak. See that big hook? It looks like a small hook. It's a very big hook. I'll show you scars afterwards. Um, and what we do is we put a little magnet on one side of the beak and a little sensor on the other side of the beak, and that sensor is sensitive to magnetic field intensity. So then what we do is when we calibrate it, so we can tell when the beak is open, and we can tell what angle it is. So here we have a trace of the depth of a dive. Um, bird swam underwater, got to the surface, had a breather, and then swam off. What's interesting is this bit here. There's strange things going on in the depth profile. For some apparent reason, it was just going up and down a bit. Um, what does the beak sensor tell us? Well, if we look at the beak angle, we can actually see that each of those um, little peaks corresponds to a fish swallowing event. So this is actually what happened. So I did one there and there and there and then came up to the surface of the water. To be perfectly honest, when I was preparing this, I tried to make all the fish disappear, but PowerPoint just got so messy. Um, okay, so that's prey ingestion at depth. 
And in, as, a, as an aside, we discovered you could tell when they were breathing at the surface. Uh, and actually, the higher the peaks, the more they breathe in. Um, so you can tell uh, individual fish. And you can actually, if you look closely, you can tell different prey. Here's an example of um, a penguin eating a fat, chunky type of fish. That's like Sylvester Stallone type fish. Um, if someone eats an apple, you, if you're going to eat an apple, you're, you open your mouth quite wide. It's the same with a penguin. If they're going to eat a fat fish, they open their, their beak wide. And if you're going to eat a Woody Allen type fish, um, then you eat it like that little girl's eating spaghetti. And so you can look at the... You can look at the signature that you get from these eating events, and you can say, that's a thin, eely type, or that's a fat, greasy type, or whatever. Uh, and it'll tell you something about their prey. There are, other, there are other things people are doing, of course, now. Just to put you in the picture, this is work by Flavio Quintana. Um, and this is where you actually take a photograph of the prey. This is an imperial cormorant. There's a penguin in the top one. That's just to show that cormorants and penguins mix. And then there's a bit of an eel sticking out here, and there's a bit of a... I don't know what there. Uh, so... Um, that's, that's entertaining. I see the maximum stomach size has disappeared off the screen. If we use these type of um, systems to find out how much Magellanic penguins eat, for example, then you discover, if you look at food ingested over 400 minutes, so eight hours or whatever it is, of, not even, um, foraging at sea, that they eat phenomenal amounts. Or they can do. They don't always. But there's a, the, the animal at the top ate nearly two and a half kilograms, and it only weighs four itself. Try eating 60% of your body weight in six hours. Um, it's only got, if its maximum stomach size is half a kilogram, and it only needs 600 grams to fulfill its daily needs, what on earth is going on? If I ate 60% of my body weight in six hours, I would require a lot of time to get rid of that. Um, and they p consume between 4.3 and 8.5 kilograms per trip, apparently. Um, so scaling that up to the whole penguin population, I've switched species for those of you who know, um, the Magellanic penguins in the world will consume about 2 million tons of prey per year. Okay, so that's a lot. If you start calculating how much uh, that represents in terms of impact or effect, if you like, on the marine system. And so that's one thing that we do need to know in terms of managing ecosystems. But the other thing is, you know, if you sit there and you think, if I was eating that, eating that, that would be three buckets of hamburgers. And how on earth can you eat three buckets of hamburgers in six hours? Um, well, if you've measured what goes into a penguin and something funny is going on inside it, you may as well measure what comes out and find out how long it takes. So here's the bumometer. Um, <laughs> same principle, magnet on one side, sensor on the other. Um, and this is a bottom event. This is what it looks like when a penguin cuts loose. And the cool thing about it is you can measure all those events. You can count them. Um, and so if you look at the number of, let's call them defecation events, um, when the penguin's on land, there's not much going on. They always have a bit of diarrhea, but there's not much going on. So a couple of poos uh, an hour. And then when the bird goes to sea, you can see it goes to sea at about midnight, um, Nothing much changes until it starts to fish. It begins feeding here. And within two hours, there's a huge amount that's already gone through. So the, the solution to the penguin being able to um, eat so much is that it digests, in, must digest incredibly fast. Let me explain how I think this works. So I've taken a penguin, and I've, re, I've turned it into a digestive tract. And so you don't get dissuaded by the penguin, we'll get rid of the penguin. And so what happens is this. This is one scenario. Is your penguin can eat rather few fish. So if it eats few fish, the fish doesn't actually go in. I should have done it the other way around. If the fish goes in, um, swallowed by the penguin, and then takes a long time to process. Okay, a lot of cooking, very little poo. Very efficient. Okay? Um, what this means is that it's just like you cooking the potatoes, you get a lot of energy out of them. A lot will happen to them if you leave them in the guts for a long time. A lot of energy per fish. That's one scenario. The other scenario is where there's tons of fish around. So the penguin eats lots of fish, stuffs it back, the cooking takes hardly any time at all, and there's a huge amount of poo. Um, and there's very little energy per fish. The penguin gets more energy at the end of the day, but little energy per fish. It's not exploiting the fish. So what does this mean? What it, what it actually means is on Tuesday, for example... 
when the penguins in their colony go out to sea and they hardly find any fish, they eat few fish, but they take all the energy out of them, um, and that preserves the fish stock. On Wednesday, they go out to sea again, and lots of fish, and so they eat lots, they use little of the fish energy, uh, and they impact the stock, but the stock's big, so it's not a problem. We don't do that as fishermen, but it's rather nice to find the system working in, in real animals. You might imagine, of course, a thing like that has ecosystem consequences. Okay? The gut movements, the bowel movements of a penguin have ecosystem consequences. Okay, so the minutia of gut movement has ecosystem consequences. Now we're going to look at the significance of even smaller movements. Okay, so we're, we're, we're zooming in on scales now. Really tiny movements. So, state secrets, the magic in tiny movement. And this is because our body moves in tiny ways according to state. Um, it actually does, and I'm going to demonstrate to you how it does. Everybody knows the coffee phenomenon. I'm really sensitive to coffee. So I have my first tea and coffee in the morning, and I'm a gibbering wreck for the rest of the day. But actually, if you use accelerometers in your tag, accelerometers pick up movement. And so um, you can have a look at how the minutia of the body movement, how much shaking and so on and so forth, varies according to condition. So what we've got here is a black screen. I love this. Oh, there we go. That's extraordinary. Um, Oh, no, no, I can't, I've got to go back. Where are you? No, it's not appeared. Well, I'm going to... I'd like you to visualise this. In that corner, in the top left-hand corner, there's a cigarette, OK, with smoke. On the right-hand corner... I don't know why it's gone, but it's gone. In the right-hand corner, there is a finger and a tiny accelerometer stuck on that finger. And that accelerometer is recording data at 1,000 times a second, OK? 3,000 in total, because it has three axes. Now, well, you've got that? This is like a, one of these magician shows. Concentrate on that. Now then. Um, oh, phew. At least something's coming up. Um, if you take... Do lots of people smoke here? Anybody smoke? Okay. Okay. We won't make an exhibition of you. Um, um, this is what happens to someone who smokes. Okay. This is time along this axis. Okay. Um, on this axis, this is the frequency of the shakes. So um, if you shake at very high frequency, you'll have, um, you'll have uh, red spikes here. If you shake at low frequencies, you'll have red, red spikes down there. And that the strength of the, of the signal is the bit that goes up. Um, and it's important to remember if you shake, you can shake at lots of different frequencies at the same time. So I can be shaking like this, and I can be shaking like this. Okay. So this is somebody who likes to smoke and who hasn't had a cigarette yet. And that is what happens after they take their first drag of a cigarette. Okay. Within seconds, the whole body starts producing tremors across all scales. It might make you feel good, but it's certainly doing some extraordinary things to your system. The point about that is, is you start looking at things like that, you realize that... Um, Examining movement and those fine scales is sort of like a fingerprint of what's going on inside your body. Okay, something else. We all know how that person's feeling, don't we? And that person. And that person. I do this at airports. You just sit there and you think, oh, they've had a bad day, or they're in a hurry, or, um, oh, that person's happy. You can tell just by looking at the way people walk how, how they're feeling. And the question is, can we do that with our tags? Can we tell that objectively with our tags? And we can with people, but I've got a much better case than people. Elephants. I know you like elephants. Um, and we had a scenario with some zoo elephants, and the zoo elephants had... Um, they were wearing the, the, the tags, and you can't say... You, if you're a zoologist and you say an animal is happy, someone will come and shoot you. So you can't say that. You say they're, they're in a positive, effective state, okay, <laughs> which means happy. Um, or they're in a negative, effective state, which means depressed, sad. So you can have a scenario in a, in, in a zoo, and we all know things that elephants like. They like the bath, they like the food, they like the mud wallow. And so you can, when they walk towards the bath, this is how they walk. 
And then they get to the bath, which they love, and then up comes a matriarch and chases them off. And they go, oh, sorry. And then they walk back. And it looks, to me, just the same. But actually, it's not the same. And um, this is a, a representation of, these are two individuals, here's one and here's the other. And the blue is, is a representation of the data of a happy elephant, no, a, a positively effective stated elephant. And the um, silver is the depressed elephant. So the extraordinary thing is, some of the principles that we can apply to humans and ascertain with humans about effective state, um, we can actually do with animals. And what's relevant about that is there are elephants in Africa that I'm reliably informed by uh, people who work on these things. They've got, they do live a long time. They have good memories. And um, there are areas they've been in that have been war-torn, and he thinks they're still worried and that they move in different ways through these environments because they're stressed. So um, the big question is, to what extent can we look at these things with wildlife? Because there's lots of man-nature conflicts. We could just go out there and measure the whole lot. Okay, who, well, the nice thing about insects is um, you can do terrible things to them. No one minds an insect having had a terrible thing done to it. And so here's our insect. It's a cockroach, okay? And it has had a, an accelerometer put on its back. Um, and that accelerometer is recording data, I think, 800 hertz. And what you can then do to your, stick, to your cockroaches is you can inject them with something that gives them the equivalent of insect flu. It's actually a really bad flu, um, worse than that. And they get sicker and sicker, and you know, they've got, you know they've got it because after 10 days the flu is so bad they die. Um, but what you can do is you can then look, you can take your cockroach and you can make it run up a gully, which they do very happily, and it looks just the same every time you do it, but you can see that the accelerometer signal on day one and day two, and day three, and four, and five, it begins to change. Okay? So, uh, depending on what sort of plot you want to, want to have, you can actually detect the state of sickness of that insect by just looking at the way it moves. This, this bit here, which is a cutout, those are leg steps of a six-legged insect. And look, by the, end of, well, by the end of day five, it's really not looking great at all. But the point about it is, is you, this, it's not a lot to see if you're looking at it as a human but the tag technology will tell you about it. So into the minds, into the well-being, and so on, of animals, we can happily go. So we can look inside the minds and get estimates of what's going on in, in animal bodies, hunger, stress, fatigue, etc. And if we knew, knew about their perceptions, um, we could maybe understand their movements a bit better, their big body, their translocational movements. And so the question is, can we determine what animals see? Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about the magic of head movement. It took me ages to find this on, on, uh, on the web. Uh, some, one of these women doing this sort of thing. It's amazingly difficult to find. Um, and this is a study done in Saudi Arabia by Mike Scantlebury with some of his colleagues from, from here. And uh, these, this are, these are the Arabian oryx, a fabulous animal. Um, and on its head, you will see one of the tags. And that tag will tell us about, there's a tag around its neck as well, will tell us about head movement, head direction, what's going on there. There it is again. See that bit up there? With a, with a pinger and all sorts of things on it. So we put that on the, on the oryx, and off they go, and they do their oryxy thing, but we can tell what they're looking at. We can tell where they're going, because we can dead reckon their tracks, and we can tell what's interesting. Uh, if you go past an oryx and you shout at it, it will look at you. Okay. And so we can construct tracks of... Oryxes. Is it oryx or oryx eye? Anyway, we can construct tracks of them. Here's the track. And each of these little hairs here, is, there's one every half a second, shows you the direction it was looking in. Okay? Let's just... Let, oh, I put this underwater because I was worried that there wasn't enough about marine fauna. So, uh, uh, yeah. Should be feeling more refreshed after that. Um, let's zoom in on this bit here. This will give you an idea of the scales over which you can, you can work. So... There's a 50-meter scale to give you an idea. And here's our oryx, and it went round in this direction. You can see, watch the little yellow blob. It was looking forward, and then it looked outside the curve, then did some funny stuff, and then looked to the right, and then went round, and so on. And the next bit down, it starts to look a bit of left and a bit of right. And the interesting thing about it is that they do all sorts of careful looking things for predators. They spin around, and also they fixate on certain things that they think are interesting. So they'll fixate on a bush, 
and then they'll go to the bush or they'll fixate on, on, on something they don't like and they'll move away from it. It's really fascinating pulling out the head behavior. It'll make more sense to you if I put it in a human context. So here's a human, and this is wearing the, the head tag, stuffed behind a headband in this case. And this is somewhat in a botanical garden in Wales. And this is the track. Now, I'll just put her in. There she is. Um, she doesn't know what's going on, what's actually been recorded. No, she's got a tag on her head for some sort of stuff. And she walks down this hill. And if you look at the way she walks down this hill, she never, ever once looks behind her. You know, if she lived in Africa, she'd be dead. But, but it is extraordinary, and if you think about it, it's absolutely extraordinary that um, humans, uh, that so much information, um, you can get so much information just by looking at the head. And you can also see that it's extraordinary that humans, we've given up looking for predators. I mean, it's reasonable enough, there aren't too many lions there. But um, uh, the color, by the way, is the head pitch. So when it's um, brown, it's head down. When it's yellow, it's head up, or the other way around. I can, no, I think it's the other way around. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about that is, is that we were talking about stuff like this isn't it, in a public aquarium. Um, if you have these things on people and you know where they are, you can see what they're looking at and how long they spend, and then you can tell by the way they walk whether they're pleased with it. Um, so animal movement is manifest in a lot of different ways. And these smart tags um, can help us to get the data to see that. This is um, Brad Norman tagging a whale shark, and there's me in the right-hand corner pretending to help him. Um, they've got really big tails, I'm not joking. Um, uh, but if you figure out that, you know, it's great to have all these tags, you put them on animals, you think 400 points per second, you very quickly get into problems with your computer and the amount of data you've got. So this is five hours data from an animal. Actually, it's a goose. Uh, and it's a goose uh, I tagged in Buckingham Palace Gardens, honestly. Um, it's a crazy thing. Five hours of animal data, 400 data points per second, that is a lot. Let me zoom in on a bit of that goose. This is five minutes of goose time in Buckingham Palace. This is five seconds in goose time. It's an incredible amount of data. Uh, uh, and we need ways to look at this information. And so what, what do we do when it all gets too much? Do we run screaming into the woods and say we've had enough? Um, well, one way to do it is to understand there are incredibly powerful models out there. This is a model you can buy off the, off the internet. But it's an elephant, by the way, in case you hadn't recognized it. But this is also a model, because they make the structure, and then they put the skin on it, and so is this. That is a model, and that model will move if you've got the computer know-how to make it do that. And so this, for example, is the movement of a whale shark, speeded up by five when it was wearing a tag. So exactly what this animal was doing, the depth, the heading, this slight weird rocking that it's doing, and the tail beats, which are about to come as it powers up, <clears throat> those are all movements that the animal elicited at the time it was wearing the tag, and those are those movements. So in other words, the, the, the quality of tags is such these days that you can create a virtual reality of your animal, and you can have it swimming through your Google Oceans uh, and doing whatever it did when it was wearing the tag. You need to be good on a computer to do this. So that's one way of doing it, and that's quite satisfying. But actually, there's lots of things it doesn't show you. Uh, and so... Um, we have to, as scientists, we can't just watch them. We have to think of other ways to compress the data. And one of the things that I've learned from working with computer scientists is, they always say this, it depends on the visualization. The glasses you wear will change the way you think. So make sure you visualize stuff in a particular way. Humans are very visual animals. So, um, and so this is something that um, I showed this morning, so apologies if you've seen it. Um, I'd like you to imagine there's a sphere that surrounds your animal, okay? And that one way you can visualize the movement of the animal is by painting that sphere. So here's a, here's a whale shark with a sphere around it, and here now is a whale shark, hopefully, painting its own sphere. So look at where the painting goes according to what the animal does, okay? When it spins, actually it just paints, as long as it's um, horizontal, it just paints the North Pole, when it rolls, it paints one side. When it rolls the other direction, it paints the other side. And so we can actually take a whole pile of data from different animals, and we can have a look at it and say, what does that look like according to the animal? So that thing on the left is a sloth. That is what this, this G-sphere, what we call a G-sphere, looks like from a sloth um, that had been wearing it over five days. 
And you can see how smooth it is. And if you're a sloth, you can hang in any, any, um, in any way you want. Uh, and it, but it doesn't move very fast. So the G-sphere is very smooth. And that is a rough lemur, a red rough lemur. And you can see it's all lumpy. But red rough lemurs actually hang in all sorts of positions as well. And compare that to an albatross sitting on a nest at the top. Not much going on there, not surprising. Or a turtle um, just diving and coming back. Or an elephant seal. So extraordinary things. And the important thing about this is not that you, not that you necessarily have to interpret it, but you can look at it and say, I can see that there are radical differences in the way these animals move. And as a derivative of that, you can produce these type of things. And you can see, well, you know, there's a fish on the top, there's the sloth in the middle, and there's a badger um, in the bottom. And again, you can see really big differences. And if you're a scientist and you want to interpret those, then it's like a punch in the face. A lot of the stuff becomes obvious. And that's dependent on, that depends on the type of plot you have. Same sort of thing. This is a cormorant diving um, and flying, I can tell you. So... Uh, a lot of what we do is dependent on, uh, nowadays, I think a really powerful way forward for looking at animal data is the, the visualization. So um, you don't have to know what that is. If you were the bloke playing with the visualization, then you could have a look at it. Um, but you can see that there are two sort of mountains and there's purpley bits at the top, and that's good enough. Um, this is something to do with the way a gannet flies. And you can pick out trends in the way a gannet flies, if you know what all that means. Really powerful images, um, aside from just looking beautiful. This is gannet flying as well. Um, aside from just looking beautiful, um, they are powerful images of the way that gannets move. This is another gannet moving. And I wonder if this is going to work. And so on our big screen, um, this is an example of uh, me t hand filming, I'm making a mess of it, some of our visualizations. This is actually um, of a swimming animal. Uh, and you can have these multiple globes going at the same time, and you can, um, uh, you can interpret them as you go along. So very, very important. The future for animal tagging is definitely going to involve this sort of stuff. Um, and this, just for fun, I put in because um, we shouldn't forget, this is, these are gulls flying. So you can see the wing beats, and this is just um, multiple images of a single gull. We shouldn't forget where we've come from, and that is that all this stuff, all this mine of information uh, about animal movement across scales, from the smallest beating of the heart uh, right up to transcontinental migrations, is, uh, there's a huge playground for us to play in. Um, I like to think uh, that this technology and the approaches we've got these days is like a, an iceberg. I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is an upside-down iceberg. So what happens if you're a penguin and you're unlucky is you're sitting on an iceberg. You know the big greatest part of the iceberg is under the water. So the penguins are sitting on the top of this normal iceberg and uh, the bit underneath gets slowly eroded away and there comes a point where the iceberg says, I'd rather be the other way up and it flips. And that is the only time you will see penguins in flight. Um, they get pro projected across the sea. But it does make this, this fantastic and completely different surface. And I... And I um, it's really, that's what technology and that's what proper visualization and that's what proper um, cooperation tells us about animals. It completely shows us the other side of the iceberg. So um, I think new, uh, these new approaches are turning things absolutely on their head in a way I couldn't have conceived of when I, when I started my PhD. So truly exciting times. And with that, thank you very much for listening to me and thank you for inviting me and it's been a pleasure to be here. <clears throat>
uh, which involves uh, Rory as one of the contributors. In fact, he's the external project leader uh, that he shares with me as an internal project leader. Then we're going to be developing the new uh, bird ring of the 21st century, so we continue to learn more about animals and including humans. So uh, before we, uh, we go, I'm sure that uh, some of you in the audience may have some questions that you would like to pose to uh, Rory. So we have a few minutes in case you have questions. And there are a couple of microphones here on the front so you can walk. And Faustine has a handheld microphone in case you would like to pose a question. You should, uh, one, thing I've, one thing I've learned is you should never say, I'm sure there are questions, because that stops all questions. You need to say, maybe there's one yes. crazy question. There is one question. Oh, there you go. Hi. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Have you when penguins get sad and when they get happy and the kind of things you can do to sort of make them happy when they're sad? Uh, more fish. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, if they're in captivity, that's, yeah, I mean, uh, I, it, it, uh, that's a sort of whole animal welfare thing. You know, they, it's like any animal in captivity. Lots of space, lots of exciting things, lots of challenges for them. Um, uh, that's the sort of way through it. Of course, if they're in the wild, whether they're happy or sad will depend on the leopard seal and on the krill and on the other things. So, yeah. And just to follow up, so have you been able to figure out for example, their favorite foods, because that would make them happy. Or... Oh, no, no, we've not done that. But that's an interesting idea, yeah. It's like Rice Krispies or Corn Flakes, yes. No. Arch uh, anchovy or sardine. No, it's an interesting one. <laughs> yes, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned that, um, how can I put this, penguin goop had a detrimental environmental effect. No, no, no. All I said is that penguin goop, it's a nice word, I like that. I pause every time I try and think of a substitute for it. So penguin goop, um, it's, it, the whole point about it is, is penguin guano, actually, is, is a fascinating way of taking nutrients from the sea and putting them on the land. That's the one thing. But the perspective that, that, um, that was going on from the penguins in the wild is if they eat a lot of fish very quickly, um, they have a lot of, uh, a lot of goop, and they're not very efficient. Uh, but they only do that when there's lots of fish around. And so when there's very few fish, they don't eat much, and they process it a lot, and the goop index is low. Uh, hi, I, I come from Lebanon, and I would like to check about a phenomenon I noticed I live, we live close to the Syrian border and we had birds who used to migrate over Lebanon to go to Syria and they used to go all around the, 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 the area and since this war started in Syria we see these birds when they cross they don't stop anymore they, they know that that is because they used to shoot them and they go straight and now they are not coming at all anymore so how, uh, how these birds know that this how they can avoid crossing from here. And do you think when the war will stop, they will come back? So I'm, I'm very intrigued because I don't see them anymore crossing over Lebanon to go to Syria because of the war. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, really, interesting, it's a really interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> there's sort of two things. One is learning in the classic sense that we learn that something is, uh, you say, you know, I'm going to teach you how to count. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And you learn that. And there's another type of learning that we engage in that you don't think about. And the, that's the learning that um, you're uh, leaning on the corner of the street and you're looking at a, uh, nothing in particular and you want to cross the road and a big yellow van almost hits you. And you get such a shock, but you, you don't get hit and you go over the other side of the road and then you carry on. And then for a long time after that, when you see big yellow vans, it will make you, it'll, it'll put you in this state of alert. Um, you, you get it with good things and you get it with bad things. And in human terms, uh, they call them anchors. But in fact, that process by which you associate something unpleasant with a particular area or a particular thing is presumably the sort of process that, that animals undergo. Um, wood pigeons in the UK, um, they've associated things that look like guns with guns. So if you carry a stick and walk along um, the hedgerow, they all fly away a long time before you 
before you reach them. Uh, if you carry no stick, they'll sit in the tree and they'll carry on. So my guess is that what happens is that um, no animal likes uh, loud noises or unpleasantries and so on. So something will have happened and they've said, well, I'm, you know, we're going to... We're going to take a route round, and so they'll uh, find a, a road that goes round. And the extent to which they come back, well, yes, that may take a very long time. If it's the straighter route, then presumably over time, if all the nonsense stops, um, then uh, they'll presumably do it. But it might take a long time. Uh, on one occasion, when I was doing work with Adili penguins in Antarctica, we had a camera set up, and they all had a particular road that they took to go from the sea back to their nest. And they were all using this road and all went straight. And the camera was set up and, and a tourist went and sat down, sort of, not absolutely in the road, but quite close to the road. And she just sat there and watched the penguins for about 10 minutes. And over that 10 minutes, all the birds that were coming out started to deviate more and more, like this, and then go round. And then uh, by the end of that time, there was a huge deviation in. So, do, 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 like, all the way around. And then the woman left and because there were all these birds walking back, they all continued to do it. So they put this deviation in, um, and it took uh, a whole day for it to go out. And she was just sitting there. Um, and I actually published on that. I worked out how many penguin meters it equated to over 24 hours, extra penguin meters. But the point about it is, is that's just a woman sitting there. Um, if she was firing rockets at them, then I'm sure it would be more than 24 hours, and I'm sure it would be a greater deviation. You talked about uh, data visualization and the different ways you can plot things. Have you ever encountered a, a behavior that, in a certain type of data, just didn't make any sense, and then you had to, you had to look at it differently, or it took a while to figure out what kind of behavior you're looking at? Yeah, happens all the time. And actually, it's one of the, it's one of the really, really cool things about visualizations and about plotting data is you can be playing with this stuff. This is why you need a big screen, like they've got here. In fact, they've got multiple big screens. But anyway, you play with the data, and, and you think, what on earth is that? Um, and actually, that circling behavior by the albatross was exactly that. You're not looking for it, and this funny pattern comes up, and you think, what? And the first thing you think is, your tag's gone wrong. You know, what's it doing? Um, and you look into it in more detail, and then, uh, and then it actually will, the whole point about it is that sort of thing will focus your mind on things you would never, ever think of. Um, and that's why visualization is so important. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, I have a question related to the expectation of the movement of the animals. Like, I'm not sure if you saw uh, a new, uh, you know, a previous movie started called Ant-Man. Yes, I saw it in the plane. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So, sorry about that. Yeah. Is there any expectation that Someday will come in the future that an action I will I will just simply tell the an insect or an animal to do it and they do it based on the research that you oh, are doing. If only we could harbour cockroaches to do the floor. Um, uh, the, I do know that there there have been people um, hooking up nervous impulses to actually cockroaches to get them to walk. Um, when they've removed the ganglia, removed large parts of what we like to call their brain. So we can get them to do that, but I mean, in the sense that you say, like Ant-Man, hey everybody, make a rope from the ceiling and I'm going to crawl up it. That, that'll never happen, I can assure you. Hi. Um, you are very good with the animal behavior and I really like what you do. Um, I work with animals in Africa and Tanzania and um, I really wanted to know why um, elephants, they're very good in remembering things. I don't know if you've been studying a little bit about it. Yeah, well... Thank you. Yes, well, it's a very good question. And actually, by the time you get onto vertebrates, and particularly warm-blooded animals, I think the, the, the longer they live, the more important it is for them to be able to remember things. Um, and so uh, you, don't have to be, you don't have to remember things long if you're an ant. Uh, but if you're an elephant and you're going to live to be 60 years um, and, uh, and as you get older then you have all this knowledge to impart, um, it's very useful to have an excellent memory because 
If you're, if you're the matriarch, for example, and you're leading the um, herd and you've discovered that there's a particular place that's dangerous, then you walk around it and because you're the matriarch, everybody else will walk around it and your herd will be better off. Thank you. So I believe this uh, will uh, be... Uh, do, you have a, do you have one more comment? Yes, please I go ahead. Um, do you think maybe in future, you know, with the technology we have, do you think we're going to maybe be able to tell why they remember? Because I think maybe we don't know clearly why. Maybe food they eat, you know, vegetation or whatever. Oh, why they do what they do? Yeah, like why they remember. What makes them remember things? They can remember things for a long time, the elephants. Yeah, well, they, you know, elephants, you know, like people, you balance things, you balance needs with, um, with expectations. So... Um, you obviously have to have food every day and you have to avoid predators and disease and all these other things. So um, the longer you live, uh, the better it is if you can remember where these things are. Because you can come back after two years and say, I remember there was a water hole here when I was a child and um, the chances are there will be one. Um, so it's all to do with survival. Um, why, do you like, like, why do you like animals? Why do you like Why animals? do I like animals? Yeah. Well, you know, to be perfectly honest, they're not as complicated as people. <laughs> uh, I'd like people, but they're just a bit difficult. So the thing about animals is they're straight up with you. If you pick up a penguin, it will bite you. Um, <laughs> there's no messing. It's quite clear. The rules between me and the penguin are clear. And I like that sort of direct approach. So, yes, that's why I like animals. Yeah, so... <laughs> I'd like, I'd like everybody to reflect on that question and ask yourselves why you like animals and maybe write it tomorrow and think about it tonight. But uh, before we do so, there was a, a, another question about the, the complexities of data. And as we load the animals with more and more data, uh, how are we going to visualize all of this data? So tomorrow we will have a presentation by Daniel Acevedo, the director of the visualization Co Core Lab laboratory, who will talk us not about visualizing data, but about sonificating data. So apparently we are a lot better in capturing, uh, cap capturing the subtleties of uh, nuances of differences in data when we hear data, because we are very good at uh, the discriminated sound and telling differences in sound and subtle differences on sound. So tomorrow we'll also uh, be enjoying sound and uh, not sonificated data, but uh, you will be enjoying a concert in this, uh, in this hall in the evening by Paul Winter and his concert. Paul Winter is sitting here on the audience and I see some of his concert members in the room, Randy, some other ones. And uh, they're going to participate in the event because they will, they will help us to reach out in terms of the importance of marine animals. Because even though they move large distances across the ocean, sound travel large distances across the ocean. And whales, for instance, are able to communicate across entire basins. And some years ago, uh, Paul Winter and his group were fascinated by whale songs, and they developed a record called Whale Tales, where each, each, uh, re each uh, tune or piece in the record was built upon the song of a whale. So tomorrow they will perform air sound, and that will include uh, music that has been inspired and built upon the sound of marine animals, upon, among other animals. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And before I say goodbye and we let uh, Rory go and enjoy a nice uh, dinner and uh, some rest, I'd like uh, to uh, acknowledge his contribution and present him with uh, a replica of our beacon. So wow. thank you, Rory, and please uh, join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow.